Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay, awesome, awesome. Attention, everyone. So we're going to be starting the lightning sections now, and I'm going to call our first um, speaker to come on board. Um, let's welcome him with our class of earns, um, Dalena. Hi everyone, thank you. Some of you have seen this already, but I was asked to do it. I want to tell you about um, being nice. I do a lot of hiring at Canonical where I work, and one question I'm often asked by candidates that I'm interviewing is, is this a nice place to work? And um, interesting question. Now, you've probably heard this advice that it costs you absolutely nothing to be nice. And it's correct, it's true. Do you know why it's true? It's true because being nice costs nothing because it's worthless. It's a gift without value. And it's time that we stopped aspiring to be nice. It's a word that's come on a very long journey from quite different meanings to the ones you might associate with it today. It has origins in uh, concepts around ignorance or stupidity. But now it's just become this kind of blah word that carries and says and commits and implies pretty much nothing at all. It's like an ineffectual ruler that's everywhere that we can't get rid of, and it rules us still. Only sadists actively want to hurt people, but we all must sometimes do things that can't be done nicely because they're going to hurt people. Sometimes we have to say things that we know will cause pain and distress. If you're a doctor, a teacher, a colleague, or a partner, sometimes you're going to have to say things that have no nice way to be said. And what we tend to do is put them off for the fear of hurting the other, and then we do them badly. Our reluctance further deepens the harm to the person that we didn't want to hurt. And it deprives them also of the opportunity to do something about it, sometimes. So, never hurting people, being nice is actually impossible. But we can be kind. And kindness is what those people who ask me in those interviews are actually asking about. Not whether it's a nice place, but whether it's a kind place. And being kind is completely different from being nice. The good doctor, the good teacher, the manager has to deliver bad news, tough make tough decisions, and do it kindly and with compassion, and gentleness, and empathy, and they have to face up to the hurt and distress or the fear that they are, know they're going to bring about by maybe saying something. So being nice costs us nothing, but being kind can actually cost us a lot. It hurts us to see somebody else's pain, and it's worse when we're the ones who are bringing it about. It takes courage to look at somebody else's pain. And saving people from all pain is simply an impossible task. Being nice doesn't help them. But being kind can help them because they get at least some truth, some comfort. And the kindness in itself is an affirmation of some kind of humanity between us and them. And it's not that it's bad to be nice. It's, but the risk of trying to be nice is that you'll be a bad doctor, teacher, manager, or partner, or bad person to be in a relationship with. And those people who, want, who try to be nice and avoid at all costs the harm can do more harm because they wanted to avoid bringing pain. And perhaps the horror of avoiding somebody else's pain so much that you don't do the right thing by them is not actually quite so admirable. So I think the, the word nice, it's kind of decayed into this blah sound um, I hope it might be swallowed up by something like the nice guy concept and we can get rid of it altogether because it's a pretty horrible word. I'd like to, uh, maybe we could take it back to meaning precise or subtle, but I think it's had its day as a word of approval. In the meantime, I do my best to avoid being or saying nice because it's no gift at all to tell someone that they are nice. There's no commitment in it. There's nothing in there for them to live up to. You haven't given them something to hold on to. But if you tell them that you were kind, you were generous, you were warm, friendly, encouraging, those are commitments. You're putting something on them, a label that they then have to live up to. 
You had to dig deeper for those words, and they will have to dig deeper to respond. You've given them a standard. So when you're tempted to be nice, ask yourself if you're just flinching from the cost of somebody else's pain. Consider paying the price of being kind. Because when I'm asked if it's a nice place to work, I can say, no, it's something that means a lot more. I'm, I'm, I'm back again for, for a few moments because we're talking about some of the forthcoming conferences and so on, so I've got a few seconds more. I want to tell you about DjangoCon Africa, which is going to take place in Zanzibar, in Tanzania, in November this year. The website is djangocon.africa. If you love Python and Django and you love traveling, this will be a chance to be part of something absolutely amazing. So come and talk to me. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, please don't forget, it's, it's good and it's not bad to be nice. See you in Africa, Dangokon, Africa. OK, so uh, our next speaker is Philippa from Pi Ladies. And after this session, we are going to be having Sarah. Um, please come to the front here so you are ready for your session. Thank you. there. Hello everyone. I'm seeing all kinds of other things in my, in my desktop. Yeah, I know, but I don't. <laughs> okay, where is my mouse? Jeez. Okay. Okay, so uh, my name is Philippa. I'm going to tell you why I'm biased. Uh, it's an unconscious bias lightning talk. Uh, this topic has been already talked about in this conference, which is great. So let's go. So unconscious bias, I asked ChatGPT to help me to put a nice sentence. Uh, so these are biases that we have without being conscious about, and they affect our thoughts about other people, how we interact with other people, and they can lead to unintentional discrimination from our side. So why am I I'm biased? Why did I choose this, this um, title? So this is me and my friend. We were talking about jobs, and we both work in tech. And she was very frustrated about her job. And after a while, I just told her, you know what? If in my company they have a junior position, I will let you know. And then there was this awkward silence, and she told me, uh, Philip, I'm not a junior. And this is when I felt really bad that my bias just affects like, the the relationship with my friend, what I said. And I'm actually grateful that she felt safe to tell me that. So, but it could be another person that would not feel safe to tell me that. So, are you biased? So I have a little game for you. There are pictures of people and you will think about, you don't need to say anything, but you can think about who do you think is what. So, who is a doctor, a nurse, electrician, or a secretary? Who is a teacher? The president? A driver? A maid? And who is smart? We hear this a lot here. Sensitive? Who is a data engineer? Last one, who is a programmer? So I hope it triggered some, some thoughts in you. So types of biases that we have just from visuals, just by looking at people, there are three, more or less. So ageism, where you, we judge people by their age, the perceived age of the person, and we judge what they can do for that. 
appearance. This includes everything from how tall you are, your skin color, your face characteristics, um, everything, your clothes. And there is the gender bias, which is one of the most famous ones. Like the perceived gender of the person might make you think something about what they can do. Okay, takeaways and conscious bias is real and it might hurt people. How you can control that? Be aware of your biases so you can stop them and avoid you from saying things you really didn't want to. Uh, our Harvard has this project implicit online. You can go there and make some tests and check your biases. One thing I really like that also was mentioned here is slow thinking. Don't jump into conclusions, don't make assumptions. Just slow thinking, take a step back, and don't think what people can do without knowing the people. Okay, be respectful, be kind to each other. I had the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all images were generated with Midjourney. Uh, I didn't uh, break any GDPR laws here. So if you are curious about the prompts I used for those images, let me know. Stay in touch. I'm in Pilates Bratislava. Those are my contacts. Yeah, see you around. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> All right, we have the next speaker now. Where do you go? Hi. After which we are going to have Sarah. Thank you. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rodrigo, and I'm here to share with you what APL taught me about Python. Now, by a round of applause, who knows Python here? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. And who knows APL? Weaker, which is good. So um, let's start with a quote by Alan Perlis that says that a language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. And Alan J. Perlis is not some random dude from the internet. It's the guy that won the first quote unquote Nobel Prize of Computer Science, which is called the Turing Award. And so I'm here to share with you how APL changed the way I think about programming, because there's two things to programming. There's knowing how to think about programming, and then there's the syntax of whatever language you're about to use. And APL impacted, apologies, APL impacted the way I think about solving problems and about writing programs. So what's APL? APL stands for A Programming Language, which is a terrible name, I agree. However, it's important to realize that when APL was invented, it was not a programming language. It was an alternative mathematical notation. And that's why APL is so infamous for its weird looks. Now, dismissing this language just because it looks weird and not the same thing as biases against humans, but the same line of reasoning applies, it makes no sense. It's as reasonable as dismissing Chinese just because it looks weird, quote, unquote, because the characters are different, right? So this is a very interesting language, and I got to program with it for a couple of years, and at some point, I realized, wait, I was writing Python code, and I realized, wait, I'm doing something different. And then I thought about it a lot, and I understood it had been my experience with APL that actually changed the way I write Python code. And I thought that was interesting. And I want to share a very concrete example. Now, the main takeaway for this talk should be explore other languages, play around with them. And the more different they are from Python, the more likely they are to have an impact. And then it's up to you to filter out the good and the bad impact and try to learn from the good things. So very specific example, this is APL code. If ages is a vector of ages of different people, this is me counting how many people are 18 or over. And the straightforward, basic, simpler way of doing this in Python is with a loop like this, right? And what I'm about to show you is a couple of transformations that step by step should make a lot of sense, but that will lead to something that may look surprising. And it looks surprising to me when I wrote it, and then I realized that I just, I did that whole process in my mind because of my exposure to APL. So first things first, I'll try to create some symmetry here, and I'm either adding one or I'm adding zero, so that I have some symmetry. I know that adding zero is the same as doing nothing, but having it up on the screen makes the next step much easier, which is to realize that you're always adding something. What changes is the amount you have, 
one or zero, that's fine. But now, what you can do is if you can, if you know that booleans and integers are tied together, you can get rid of the ifs and you just have the condition. I'm not saying this is excellent Python code, I'm just saying this works. And then, well, you can take it one step further and you can do a sum over a generator expression. Now again, I'm not saying this is excellent Python code, I'm not saying it's gonna pass the code review, I'm just saying that for some reason I wrote this down and I realized it was because of the connection with the APL code, which stands one to one. I'm just, I don't care about the for loop in APL, but the remainder of the things, they're one to one. And my expo exposure to APL made me actually very comfortable with least comprehensions because suddenly I understood what to me least comprehensions are about or the way I interpret them, my mental model of how they work. And so this is summing. And just one other thing, sum and APL. Now there's a bunch of built-ins and their APL counterparts. And if you see the pattern on the right, this showed me that the functions on the left, they're all related. And I've talked about this in the past. Mm -hmm. They're all reduced. And I think I need to go. Yes. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for that. OK, let's have Sarah while we are. Um, hi, you're welcome. Um, we're going to have um, Alba? Alvaro. Alvaro, OK. Um, Ricardo, are you there? Yeah. OK. Alvaro, are you there? Sorry if I didn't pronounce that well. Um, are you in the, okay, okay we we'll skip. Um, then the next one will be you. Florian. Florian, okay. Uh, Florian, are you? Okay, all right. Are you? Ah, thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Sarah. Oh, is this? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you very quickly about what is federated learning. Um, so that's gonna be like a two minute introduction. First, a little bit of context. What do everyone want? Well, we want to have like these really great machine learning models, either because we are data scientists or because we are using them. But the problem is that all of these data, uh, all of these machine learning models, they require data, quite a lot of it, and not just any data. They require high quality data. And uh, you want to have data that is representative of what you are going to do. So you want to have like varied data. And um, it brings a lot of problems. It can bring some technical issues, some legal issues, depending on the kind of data you're working with. But the most important part for me, it's bringing a privacy issue. Because as a data scientist, I want to have a lot of data. But as an individual, I want my privacy to be protected. So how can you? like solve this conundrum. So there's a bunch of so-called privacy and anti techniques, uh, which include, you might have heard about it, some differ differential privacy or homeomorphic encryption, these kind of things. And federated learning is one solution to, um, like one solution or one part of a solution on how to, you can solve this data privacy issue. Um, What's happening uh, on the typical machine learning pipeline is what's on the left side. Uh, it is like you are taking data from a bit of everywhere and you are putting it in a centralized location and then you are training your model on it. What federating learning is proposing to do is roughly the opposite. It's say, okay, the data is gonna say what's generated and then you are going to make your model or part of your model travel to the data and uh, do rounds like that uh, until you get an aggregated model which is generating on all of the data. Um, so, as I said, <laughs> the field is growing a, a lot right now. So, especially for federated learning, uh, there are a lot of uh, open source libraries which are getting quite mature and ready to be used. Um, Federated learning, obviously, it's <laughs> quite vast. And so depending if you need some things to iterate for simulation very quickly, or if you need something which is more industry grade because you want to deploy it in production, depending if you're doing federated learning with a lot of mobile phones, for example, or if you're doing federated learning in a more industrial context where you only have like a few data centers, um, you're gonna have like different libraries fitting more or less your need. Uh, so I'm the mentioner of, uh, one of the mentors of Substra, so I can talk to you a bit more about that. 
Uh, we've got a hugging face space if you want to, to play out of it and have a, a demo to see how federation learning might be working. Um, also, you know, classical GitHub, we've got the Slack and all of that. And more importantly, I'm really looking forward to meet with other people who are working on this data privacy issue. I, I know that there was some like um, data anonymization talk earlier on, uh, but really, like, uh, please say hi if you're interested in these topics. And yeah, thank you. Nice. <laughs> thank you so much. That was really fun. Okay. Um, next, we have Ricardo. Um, let's appreciate. You got this. You can stand. stand. Uh, do you have a chicken, man? I do not agree with also. Okay. 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 Are you ready? Yes. Your time starts already. Okay. You got this. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, a different travel program. Wait. Uh. Uh, I'm Ricardo and I'm 11 and I play football and piano. I'm learning Python. Uh, for example, this program makes a square. I came by train with my father. Uh, we want to save the planet. Uh, this is the several stops. Latina, Roma, Bolzano, Monchen, and Praga. Children love AeroPython, uh, so bring them. Thank you for your time. Awesome. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> you did so well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have um, the, Pi, the Pi community? Florian. Florian. Oh. Oh, Florian first, then we have the Pi community next. Um, the, Pi community rep, are you there? Okay, all right. Um, your time starts now. Thank you. Yeah. Your time is so. Oops. Okay. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. So, fstring.help, or how I bought yet another domain. Could you raise your hand if you know about pyformat.info? That's like half of you or so. So, it's a website which shows you when .format was new, new style string formatting, how to do formatting with like person formatting and then with string.format. Well, it would make sense to have F strings there, right? That's what someone thought in 2015. Then someone seemed to agree in 2017. And the same thing happened again in 2019. I also looked kind of into that, like maybe opening a pull request, but there were some discussions around uh, whether how the examples would really fit in. And it looked like the project was pretty dead, unfortunately, with lost activity dying around 2017. I took a look at the commit list and, uh, history and saw, oh, there's a version two. Okay, let's check the version two. Well, looks like that was dead as well, unfortunately. 
So I thought, okay, why not take matters into my own hands and start fstring.dev? Cool little domain, right? I didn't do it for three years until one day before the PyCon Germany lightning talks, because, hey, you could tell people about this at the lightning talks, so let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently the domain was gone by then. Just a few days after I um, came up with the project idea, and the domain was still free when I did. Uh, gone to Contacts Privacy Inc. Customer 7151 something. Uh, if you're here in the audience, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> because the, the fstring.dev is like very well used, apparently. Well then, I had to come up with a new idea for a domain. So what about fstring? Well, kind of cool, but 100 euro for like a, a small side project just isn't quite worth it. But hey, let's see, like, maybe there are some promotions going on for, for cool new top-level domains. Fstring.cat, why not? Five euro, cool. Well, apparently to get a cat domain, which is a, actually a country domain of Catalan, um, you need to belong to the Catalan linguistic and cultural community on the internet. You know, obviously like Nyan.cat, for example. So yeah, in the end I came up with fstring.help and it's exactly what it says. It's a small overview of how fstring syntax works with maybe some things you didn't know about fstrings and a nice overview of the rest. Sadly, not quite mobile ready. Uh, if someone knows how to make a nice mobile ready website out of a Jupyter notebook, let's talk about it at the sprints maybe. I also teamed up with Trey Hunter, who had this nice, even more compact cheat sheets of F strings, which you can now reach with the cheat sheet button on the page. I want to close with some news. Python 3.7. 3.7 was end of life, which means all currently supported Python versions now support self-documenting expressions, where you can use a um, format a variable inside an F string with an equal sign, and in the output you get both variable name or expression, it can be an expression here, and the result. Also with upcoming Python 3.12, um, any Python expression syntax is valid syntax inside fstrings. So despite my syntax highlighting here, really not liking it yet, um, you can do things like comments inside Python code inside fstrings if that's something you find useful. Last few seconds with another shameless plug. I'm the maintainer of Qt Browser, a Vim-like browser, basically like Vimium but without all the web extension limitations. I might do some stuff on it at the sprints. And if you want a sticker or a PyTest sticker, feel free to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was right on time. All right, so let's have Alex uh, from the Py community. And we also have some other communities joining. <laughs> You're welcome on stage. Is it on? Yeah, that's on. Okay. We need your full attention. You're going to be confronted with at least 15 questions you have to basically answer immediately. And let's start with the first question. Who likes waffles? Whoop! <laughs> okay. So PyData Stamon is coming in September from 14 to 16. Who likes Basel? <laughs> Speaking of Basel. Um, uh, EuroSciPy will be in Basel, uh, August 14 to 18. This time didn't work so much. Uh, no. That's why. Um, conference, it's like two days of tutorials, two days of talks. One day, maintain the sprint tracks. Um, tickets are online, please come. Oh. Who loves beer? <laughs> so please join us at PyCon CZ in September in Prague. 
We have a beautiful venue, which is an old monastery, so it's going to be beautiful. As you can see, the tickets are on sale, so I hope that you can all join us. Uh, also, one of the tracks is Pi Data oriented, so uh, I think it will be really interesting for all of you. So please come in September. Who have tried patatas con mojo picón? <laughs> Where are in the Paikones and Canary Island is the best place in Europe, you know. And we want you to join us in October 6, 7, 8. This year is online and also in person. So that's what we expect you on Canary Island. This is interesting. Who likes Basel not together with mountains of chocolates? <laughs> okay, GeoPies 2024 will be in May 27 to 29 in Basel, Switzerland. Link is there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We won't have chocolates for your sci fi, by the way. <laughs> Who likes ketchup? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so Python US is in Pittsburgh, which is apparently the home of Heinz Ketchup, uh, in addition to also hosting uh, Python US for the next two years. Uh, we would love to see you there. I know it's really far from here to get to PyCon US, so we have a travel grant program which you should contact us about. But, uh, you know, give us a little bit more time because it's all the way in May next year. This may be a weird question, but who likes homemade food? Oh. Attention, attention. First time Pile Ladies Con. Oh. When? Oh. December. Oh. Where? Oh. Online. Oh. What are we going to have? Keynotes, talk, panel, and much more. 24 hours conference. <laughs> more info soon. <laughs> who knows what this is? Brinzove Halushki, the National Food of Slovakia, and you're all invited to PyCon Slovakia, which will be in March next year. Oh, it's me. Who likes barbecue? <laughs> okay, you know, there's a big PyData barbecue coming up. Where is PyData barbecue happening? Because PyData is Nam Focus, Nam Focus is all in Austin, so it should be happening in Austin, Texas, right? No, it's happening actually here in this beautiful place. This is uh, Heidelberg, Germany. It's in southwest Germany. Uh, and I'm happy to announce the fifth by the barbecue with keynote speakers you probably heard of. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Who likes pastries? <laughs> so we're going to have PyCon Portugal from the 7th to the 9th of September. It's the second edition. Uh, yeah, show up. And uh, just, just today, for EuroPython participants, you have a 25% off voucher. It's just this slide, so if you want it, it's now, or it's gone forever. <laughs> Three, two, one. one. Who likes fish and chips? Woo! I thought we don't have good food, but uh, Party to London, 2024, in June. Uh, there will be a Father's Day. Bring your kids as well. We will have coding things for kids. Yes. OK. Who likes muscle? <laughs> <laughs> Next year, Zangcon uh, will happen in Spain, Vigo. Join us. Who likes donor kebab? Okay, so PyData, PyCon is coming back to Berlin. Yes, it was invented there. <laughs> uh, so in April from 22 to 24. Who loves Barbie soup? <laughs> Come taste it in Vilnius, Lithuania in April 2024. Yeah. <laughs> I love communities. Please, a round of applause for them. Um, thank you so much. This is just the last one. <laughs> okay, 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 I promise. Who likes pizza? Come on. <laughs> PyCon US has been announced already. See, this cannot be PyCon US. Oh. This is genuine Italian pizza, by the way. And this is a less genuine Italian Python pizza. We don't have it. Uh, so we have PyCon Italy 2024 already. Uh, 
We forgot to update the slide, but anyway. Uh, it will be May next year in Florence, essentially the very same venue where this T-shirt, Europe Python 2011, was collected. And this is standard reaction if you ask for pineapple pizza in Italy, so please don't do it. And who likes spam? No, nobody does. Nobody. nobody. Please let's clap for them. Thank you so much. Uh, Chin, you can come up. I love community and I love um, the action and the morale that they brought on stage. Uh, please come up. So after Chi, we have Medel from. Chin. Yeah. The next person. Oh, okay. All right. I don't have the next person, so I want to find one. Is this, this is, are you there? Tell me, tell me when does my time? Are we starting? Yes. Oh, okay, can I start now? You might have. Oh, we're already gone, oh, okay, okay, sorry. All right, hi everyone, I'm Chin. Okay, so this is a quick heads up about two things. This isn't really quite as fun as other food. I'm really sorry, but I've managed your expectations. Okay, so the first thing is that there is an open source educational resource uh, with free material. Oh. Okay. Okay. You don't need that? Sorry, technical problems. This is when I say I'm a data scientist, not a, a hardware specialist. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay, great. So um, anyway, there's this program thing which uh, I, uh, oh no, that's still not working. Oh. Yes, great. Okay. Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is Sports Python, which, uh, oh no, this way, which I uh, authored with a, seeded by a grant from the Euro Python Society. This is basically an outreach program um, teaching Python and data science to uh, especially people who are from marginalized uh, groups. So this is me teaching, these are people I've taught, that's a GitHub. Okay, number two, if you're a Pythonista who cares about sustainability, I am working on a new open source project to democratize Python for environmental advocacy, and it's called Pick Aside, Planet or Profit. What is it? So currently it's a not very good GitHub page because I am a data scientist, not a web dev. Uh, you can obviously contribute to that um, at some point. So what is this actually? Uh, about, it's about developing free code that anyone can use for data journalism, citizen science investigations. Um, so, uh, this is not a new concept, you know, putting stuff on a map so people can sort of see what's happening to the planet and it's dying and burning. But I think what is more useful or interesting about this is that uh, my, pro this project, it will basically have reproducible data science workflows so people can uh, basically try and analyze things themselves. So for example, this is uh, the college, colleges in the US, well in Boston in this particular case, uh, who have power plants which are excessive carbon emitters, so polluters. Uh, anyway, so that's what it is, you can look that up. Um, why? Uh, so why do we need environmental advocacy um, and hence why do I think this project is necessary uh, to democratize data journalism, citizen science and education? That is because there is a ton of denial and disinformation. Um, there's a lot of interested parties like Big Oil who are basically making a lot of money um, in the short term by effectively exploiting the planet. AI generated junk is not helping nor is the free press under attack. So where does the idea come from? So. <laughs> Um, I don't know what people think about me, but actually, um, I actually used to be the first head of data science at the Foreign Office, and I actually investigated environmental issues when I was supporting uh, UK foreign policy. So, uh, because enough time has passed, I did a tutorial at PyCon US, oops, this year. You can look that up uh, as well. No, go away. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the kind of um, content which was in there was, so this for example is deforestation in the Amazon basin. This is actually really interesting. This is uh, the border between Bolivia and in this case the Ron Rondonia state in Brazil, which tells you a lot about different governments, governance in different regions. Um, anyway, the point was there was a lot of ways of showing how Python open source software uh, was great for democratizing um, effectively, you know, citizen slash individual access to exploring topical issues. Uh, it had really good interest and feedback um, sorry, by these kind of people. And if you're from the geospatial community, the fact that Esri was there at my tutorial was really interesting. Um, so anyway, uh, can you help the Pick Aside project by collaborating, contributing, 
stuff. It doesn't have to be technical. It can be design stuff, anything. Uh, spreading the word, potential users. Really easy one. All those people who just came up on stage, invite me. Invite me to speak to your meetup. Um, and also, remember, the US tutorials, you have to pay 150 bucks to get to that, so not on top of your travel costs. So this is going to be you know, a good bang for your buck. Um, sourcing ethical funding. So, so for example, I say ethical because, for example, if you're from the UK and you know uh, over energy, um, they are kind of um, greenwashing, so, and so I don't really want money from them. Um, this is not to say that I want dollars. <laughs> um, it's actually because uh, the funding, which, for example, this Washington Post journalist, who's actually someone in, uh, involved in the PSF, used to be a board member, um, a lot of those funding are US-centric, so they're only for investigating US issues. And unfortunately, uh, environmental issues are not US only. Um, uh, or and or you could help by building a community environmentalist tech folk and these are some of my contact details please get in touch or you know find me at the social um, I'll try not to be too drunk thank you very much and that was right on time please thank you okay up next we have Mida Mida you can come on stage and after which we have our last talk for this year um, visit Yes. Okay. And your time start now. Good luck. Thanks. So. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, at our team, we ran into uh, a ticket where. Uh, we had to run Python environments in an isolated environment. I mean, Python run, sorry. We had to run Python in isolated environments. Okay. So environments have to be programmable. So Python has to be able to define the environment, define the machine type, and run it uh, the, way, the way we want it. And uh, we need to be able to choose different backends to, to run those environments. And the backends should include um, virtual env, conda, mamba, pyenv, everything. Okay, so we naturally built it, we were happy with it, and we made an open source project out of it. And uh, yeah, this is the link to it, and we have the, the QR code. Okay, so how does it look? Uh, the isolate, we call it isolate. Isolate works with uh, backends. So here we have a backend, uh, which is a virtual Python environment backend. And uh, all you have to do is you have to create the environment, you pass it some requirements, uh, you, you, you create it, and then you uh, you know, open a connection to it, and you send a function to it, and it will run it in the environment that you defined. Uh, this works so well, actually, that we uh, built a product around it. So now we have a product called File Serverless, and uh, from, you know, where we wrap the isolated around it, um, and uh, uh, we have an isolated decorator where you define the requirements, you define a machine type, and you define a function, and so now when you call this function, it does not run on your computer, it runs on file serverless. Uh, you don't have to think about infrastructure, anything like that. And uh, how far can you take it? You can take it pretty dang far. So we have an open source repository here called Edit Anything App. It's a full stack application that has Python as a backend. So here you see we have a simple Flask application that has this isolated decorator with the machine requirements. And we define a bunch of different uh, endpoints, and each endpoint is calling a Python function, and in the function we're doing some ML inference. Um, yeah. So, and the repository also has some front-end code that interacts with the deployed application, so now you have an end-to-end -end full stack Python application. So this is the front-end of the application, and uh, as you can see, we have a simple UI. It's also open source, so the QR code there is the, uh, the link to the GitHub repository. Here, we're calling one endpoint to create a mask of the, of the bus. So it's quickly created. I, I click on the, on the desired mask. I write a prompt for the replacing. This is another endpoint that replaces an object inside the picture. Uh, this is using control net. And so we run it. This is starting up a machine, running the inference, killing the machine. And uh, here we have the picture. So in summary, Isolate for running your uh, isolated environments, and Edit Anything is the app that we built on top of our platform, and our platform called File. This is our team. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, and see ya. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. OK, so let's have our last speaker for today. Vincent, you're welcome. 
time starts now. Right. Uh, one more. You. Ah, great. So I wanted to talk to you guys about terminals because we like them, uh, especially modern ones. For one thing, they support uh, Unicode, and. <clears throat> Specifically, I wanted to show you two um, Unicode characters, upper half block and lower half block. If you print them, you get, you get this nice cross pattern. And if you print more of them, mm -hmm, you get a chessboard. Now you can bring uh, colors into it by using NC code. So that would look like this. Um, but we can do more. We can draw stuff. So uh, let's draw a bird. So that's a bird. It's a huge string, but uh, it's a bird. If you print it, you get a bird. It's the bird from Celeste. Um, but it's only a string, right? So if it reaches your terminal, then it gets printed, which means a server, an SSH server, could send it to you. So if you were to SSH into send me a bird, maybe the SSH server would send it to you and it would get displayed. But uh, I think we can do better than that. So what would happen if you were to SSH into um, a server which runs a Game Boy, Game Boy Color emulator? would look like this. So do you know what game that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you don't get sound over SSH. That's too sad. Uh, it's The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And you, you can actually play that. Um, so what you just saw is a project of mine. It's called Gambate Terminal, and it's a terminal front end for an existing Game Boy Color emulator, which is called Gambate. It's written in Python, it's optimized with Cython, and it's uh, powered by two amazing libraries called Async SSH and Prompt Toolkit. Uh, you can try it out. Uh, you can either SSH into the server or you can install it locally using, using pip and run it directly with your own very legit ROM. Um, oops, sorry. And that's it. You can check out the repository and uh, I'll see you at the social event. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and that's all for the lightning talk for this for today. Uh, for those that are going for the social um, events later this evening, see you there. And if you are not going, see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone. And special thanks to the speakers. Thank you.